and welcome to the Switch for Good podcast. I'm Alexandra Paul, and I'm here with my wonderful co-host, Dotsie Bausch. Hi, Dotsie. Hello. So we have a, a guest on who's v- very, very good at speaking about veganism to people, especially to non-vegans. And yeah. you and I were doing our research, and a story came up from you about your experience in talking to non-vegans. So share it with yes, us. Yes, yes. And as, as people know, if they clicked on the episode, right, and that's why they're listening to it, we have we have Earthling Ed today. And I, I, I yeah, I, I admire him so much for uh, his he, he's an he's an orator, but he is one that is uh, especially fantastic and effective in debate style oration. And uh, when I mentioned this to you and told you that I was terrible at that style, you're like, no, you're a great speaker. And I'm like, OK, I can I can do a, a mean TED talk if no one's fighting with me. I, I, I can. I will, I'll be confident in that area. But the second anyone wants to start fighting with me, uh, I get the clamped. I get too emotional, which we, we you you said you start feeling like that too when you used to do political debates. Um, I get hot and sweaty and mangy under my <laughs> armpits, and I suddenly become. Uh, I have a brain filled with no facts, which normally I can spit out like all sorts of different facts or just, you know, ask kind of ask people questions if they're not trying to get in my face. I I feel like that is a effective way to kind of turn the question back on them kind of thing. If it's if it's calm and loving, then it's it's not so bad. But I had a scenario where um, Klaus from Plant Based News, I think he thought because I don't know. Because I'm an Olympian, I'm going to be like, I can just, you know, (laughs) ran through anything or anyone and be able to be effective. So he's like, how about you do a debate with Frank Tufano, who is a uh, very young man, definitely probably 25 years younger than I am. He has a YouTube channel. He's a carnivore. Uh, His most popular videos are the carnivore that went vegan for one day. Uh, Of course, he felt terrible because... Because we carnivores are wimps. Well, well, there's that. Maybe that's good. Good. Because their good. microbiomes are um, not very balanced. <laughs> yeah. So he said, you know, why don't you debate Frank and and Klaus kind of emceed it, and you know, it wasn't live, so it was taped or whatnot. Um, but I was not thoughtful. I was not clear. I was not educational. I was not helpful. I couldn't think of anything. All I wanted to say was just stop murdering things. That's really the end of what we're saying here, you know, because he was like super in the weeds, right? And very, he was an effective debater for sure, way more effective than I was to where we did not air it because it was so bad. <laughs> I kind of felt bad because we're like, oh, that's kind of swayed or skewed if we're not. But I could barely speak. So. I'm excited to talk to Ed and 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 learn. Uh, I, I, you know, selfishly, I, I really want to learn like physically and just internally what happens to him physically when a debate gets hot because he's been in multiple debates. He he sometimes posts tables outside of colleges and university and is like, you know, debate the vegan. So he's asking for it. So I, I'm excited for so many uh, reasons to have him on, but uh, yeah, to learn most importantly. Yeah, me too, because I'm with you, Dotsie. My voice gets really high, <laughs> and I start to get really, ah, like yeah. this, which it doesn't really inspire confidence Mm-mm. in the listeners uh, from my side at all. So I used to do, um, I did three of, um, oh gosh, Politically Incorrect with Bill Maher. Mm-hmm. Oh, I think he liked me because I was really progressive, and it was hard for him to find progressive women that would come on the show and uh, debate things. Uh-huh. And I remember, I just... Uh, I was. <laughs> it was horrible. We're like we're like babies. Ah, <laughs> stop. That's exactly right. Oh my gosh. That's how I feel. Uh, yeah, and and so passionate about it, but it doesn't. It passion doesn't necessarily translate mm-hmm. well when you're trying to get your points across. Mm-hmm. So Ed is really great at this, and let let me tell you tell you all listening and watching a little bit uh, about him. He, he is as calm as a cucumber. <laughs> Uh, But he's also rocked the world with his eye-opening lectures on animal welfare. Ed Winters, who's also known, as you said, Earthling Ed, is a driven young activist who has spoken at over one-third of all UK universities and given guest lectures at top universities around the world, including six Ivy Leagues here in the United States. He's got two really, really good TED Talks. 
Um, what was originally just a one-man YouTube channel back in 2016 has exploded into a London-based nonprofit, speaking tours, and a successful nonprofit vegan restaurant. Mm -hmm. So, everybody, get ready to glean some major inspiration and motivation to spread the compassionate word. Welcome to the show, Earthling Ed. Thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be here and to be able to speak with both of you. And uh, yeah, that was a lovely little introduction. So thank you so much for that as well. <laughs> You're very welcome. It's our honor mm -hmm. to have you. So what, what, when you heard Dotsie's, uh, Dotsie's talk, what, what came up for you? Uh, her, her, us discussing how she was with the carnivore. <laughs> I mean, we've all been there. It's nothing, um, there's nothing unusual about that reaction. I remember when I first started doing some debates at the beginning, you do feel very panicky and you do feel like you're overly emotional. And it's very easy to say what, as you were saying, Doxy, about just saying, well, you know, just stop killing animals. And that's kind of like the bedrock of the argument, isn't it? And so it's so easy for us just to fall back and allow our emotional side to just want to say that. So quickly and ardently. And so I think we've all been there and I certainly have. And I don't think by any stretch I, I would like to um make the you know i'd like to make the point that hopefully i am cool as a cucumber but sometimes inside i don't feel that way either you know we, we've all had those moments and i'll have sit, sit down and debate and someone will come next to me and you know maybe they'll say something i've not come across before i'm not very well versed in responding to and you do have that little moment where you just want to check yourself and so it happens to everyone definitely because we're so passionate about the cause and mm -hmm. you know it's such a high stakes conversation all the time it's something well an animal's life or many animals lives are on the line and so it's easy for us to allow that to get us to maybe a point where we feel ineffective and maybe flustered because it is such a high stakes conversation when we discuss veganism and animal rights, of course. As an athlete, I love uh, to prepare for anything with a lot of training. So you've obviously, I mean, you've obviously had a lot of experiences in this, therefore a lot of training. Is there... Is there something, is there, is there a process that you walk yourself through or that you just kind of now instinct, instinctively do when something is, is, uh, is getting really heated and you might not feel super confident in that area? Is there something that you do in your, within your body? Is there a meditative state? Is there, how do you kind of come out of it the other side pretty instantly so that you can answer calmly and intelligently? That's a really good question. I think that... I mean, it's the same for most of us. When we start to get panicky or the conversation starts to get maybe a little bit more aggressive or goes to a position where we don't want it to be, we have a habit of starting to speak fast and speak louder. And so I try and just maybe slow it down, repeat the question back or repeat what someone said to me back to them. That, wow. that does two things. It slows the conversation down, but it also gives you a bit of mental space to think about what you're going to say next. So I think being very careful over the tempo of the conversation is really um, an important way of just diffusing any situations and also gives you that bit of extra breathing space. So I think that definitely helps. I think on a, on a wider point in terms of preparation or, you know, things to do, I always say to people, you know, practice is our friend, just like you were saying if, um, when you, you know, obviously we're in the Olympics, practice is, is our friend. And so training and doing what we can all the time is really, really important. And so when I say to people is go home and it's almost like a script, you know, look at the different excuses that exist. What are the main arguments that people use? And if you've got a, you know, if you're fortunate enough to have a vegan partner or, you know, you know, friend or sibling, then maybe you can have little mock conversations or mock debates with people who are around you who you can trust to do that. And it just builds up your confidence because I think, Part of the problem is we know what we want to say, but we often struggle actually getting those words out. Mm -hmm. You know, we have it all in our head and we know exactly how we feel about something, but then to put that into words that are coming out of our mouth in a very you know, fluent way can be very challenging. I think just practicing saying what we want to say, whether it's on our own or with a vegan loved one, can really help us when we're in those, those conversations or in those debates. So taking some time to really research and read about the different excuses and just get used to saying the arguments back, you know, the, what your argument or response would be. Just get used to vocalizing that out loud. I think that really helps as well. What is the, um, what is the most, what are some of the most common reasons that people argue why one shouldn't go re vegan or for carn carnism? Taste is such a big one. I think taste is probably the biggest one. Mm. And I think it's the most sincere one that people use because 
it doesn't reflect well on you to say the reason you kill animals is because they taste nice. It doesn't paint you as being a particularly good person. But I think people use that excuse a lot because it is true and sincere. And I think a lot of the time, you know, non-vegans will get kind of hung up on more philosophical ideas and maybe hung up on kind of different excuses. Oh, lions eat meat. Our ancestors used to do it. But really, when it boils down to it, it's just because people enjoy it. It's a habit. It's a routine. It's convenient. It's what their families have done. There's social pressure, especially for you know young men, of course. There's a lot of peer pressure there as well. So I think when it boils down to it, it's kind of selfish reasoning. You know, We, we sometimes make appeals to, to different reasoning, but I think it's normally a selfish thing. It's hard for me to give up. I like how they taste. My friends wouldn't like it. My family wouldn't like it. Things that are really appealing to the sense of self, um, you know, which isn't necessarily and ultimately a bad thing because we you know, live our life trying to fulfill the self. But in the case of what we do to animals, it becomes very destructive when we put our own desires in front of them. And I think people are good people. And most people are you know, very much against animal cruelty and animal suffering. But on this one massive thing, this whole animal farming complex, we turn a blind eye because... It's something that we enjoy. And I think even though that's the most obvious excuse, the excuse I hear the most, I think it's probably one of the easiest to convince people is wrong because obviously um, it just is terrible. Um, but I think that's probably the number one. So what do you say? Do you just talk to yeah. about the alternatives? I mean, what, what do you think? Because, you know, obviously our taste buds change over time and it can, they can change in, a, you know, 21 days. I, mine certainly did. And it's like, oh, all of a sudden these new flavors. But how do you get them? in that past that spot of because the the first day second day third day it's like wow like i remember the first time i had vegan cheese right. I, I went to um like a health food store near me and i bought these beef burgers vegan beef burgers and vegan cheese and i said like, oh fantastic i'm gonna have a, a vegan beef burger tonight everything will be as it was a few weeks ago and i took a bite out of it and was like wow this is this is not what I was expecting. This is not good. So I think we do have that moment at the beginning. Thankfully, you know, that vegan cheese is still not very good, but thankfully there's lots of good ones now, of course. So I think we do all have that moment at the beginning where we need to adjust and we need to, of course, settle into the new foods and the new flavors. So for me, I think what I try and reason with people when they talk about taste is I don't try and sell them the idea that all vegan food is going to taste the exact same and all vegan food is amazing. You know, most vegan food is fantastic, of course, and it's getting better all the time. But I think what I try and show people is that regardless of whether or not we like these meat substitutes or cheese substitutes, there's still no foundation for us to continue exploiting animals. And so I always say to people, well, what has higher value, taste or life? Because of course, when we kill an animal, we're taking their life from them, right? And so when we Eat, even if it's dairy or eggs, as we all know, someone is being killed for those products somewhere in the supply chain. So what is high value taste or life? Now, most people will say life because that's the reasonable position to take, yeah. in which case, well, you've pretty much proven why taste isn't a good argument. But some people will say taste because they maybe want to be awkward. Maybe they genuinely believe it. And then I say to people, well, if we're saying that taste is more important, then what we're actually doing is saying that sensory pleasure is a moral justifier for what we do because of course taste is a sense and enjoying something because of the taste is enjoying something because of sensory pleasure. So we're taking the animal's life for sensory pleasure. And I say, well, is that a moral justification? Can we use that in other scenarios? Because of course there's many scenarios where someone feels sensory pleasure at the expense of someone else. And we would never say that those were morally justified because there's a victim. And of course the animals are the victims in our pursuit of taste pleasure in this instance as well. So mm -hmm. simplifying it like that, I think, really shows to people the absurdity of that argument and then saying, look, we've got so many great vegan products, give them a go. If you don't like them, give it a few weeks, come back and try it again. But importantly, yeah. stick at it. And I think that conviction and determination in those first few weeks is of course crucial. And when you get through that, it's smooth sailing beyond that point. I heard you on <clears throat> on uh, your, I think it was your YouTube channel and you had, um, you'd watched Joe Rogan's interview with uh, John Stewart who was formerly of The Daily Show, I think who has a new show coming out, and he was probably promoting that. But on that, in that interview, Jon Stewart talked about his veganism. He, his wife has a sanctuary, mm -hmm. and so he's become vegan. And unfortunately, Jon Stewart wasn't very adept at discussing why veganism is worthwhile and the benefits of it and combating Joe Rogan, uh, talking about hunting. But you... You, uh, Earthling Ed, did a fantastic job. Uh, what you did was you played J Joe Rogan's um, uh, uh, arguments for why hunting is justified, and then you shut shut the tape off and answered well, how we would have wanted John Stewart to answer. So I was really impressed, and 
Can you talk about the the folks who talk about hunting and what their normal arguments are and your rebuttals to that? Yeah, absolutely. Hunting is um, a big, big issue, particularly in the US. I mean, we have hunting here in the UK where I am, but in the US, it's just a, a huge issue. Um, and there's two main arguments that hunters tend to use. One is conservation and the other is kind of a, an appeal to some sort of ethical idea. Oh, well, we kill the deer because if we didn't kill the deer, well, then, you know, a predator might kill the deer or, um, you know, something might happen, they might get a disease or a bacteria or something, um, and they might die in a worse way. I think for the conservation one, that's pretty straightforward because we have to look at the reasons why. People say we have to hunt deer because there's an overpopulation. I said, well, there's a reason why that's happened because it's not a natural occurrence that, of course, there's so many deer and no predators and this kind of imbalance in the food chain has occurred. And, of course, well, the main reason that we have no wild predators, mainly none left, and also because we have such less land than we used to for these prey animals to wander around is because of animal farming. In in the U.S., for example, just under 50% of uh, mainland U.S., so excluding Alaska and Hawaii, is dedicated to animal farming. I mean, that's absolutely in, in, insane. And of course, when we dedicate land to animal farming, that involves a couple of things. Erosion of the land. We have to either deforest or turn whatever land is there into land that's suitable for animal farming, whether that's the grazing land, so the grasslands, the pastures, whether it's the cropland to grow the crop that we feed to the animals, or whether it's just the buildings themselves for the factory farms. Of course, we're converting this land. So we take it away from nature, take it away from the animals who live in the wild, take it for a human purpose. And then, of course, we've got animals grazing. And of course, animals grazing are susceptible to being hunted by predators like cougars, you know, um, coyotes, or any type of predator, wolves. And so farmers, and working with the USDA, there's an agency called the Wildlife Services Agency, who's part of the USDA, they hunt and kill millions of wild animals every single year to protect the interests of animal farmers. And so hunters will go, oh, well, we've got no choice. We've got to hunt these animals now because there's so many of them. When actually the argument should be made that if we really cared about restoring the natural world and protecting the whole food chain, the best thing to do would be to eliminate animal farming, free up up to about three quarters of the land that we currently use for agriculture by switching to a plant-based diet, rewild that land, re you know, restore it, reforest it, return it back to the natural world, which is better for us, for the planet. And importantly, over time, of course, it would take many years, over time, we start to restabilize and restore the natural balance of the world. But the problem is hunters don't want to do that because that would in the long run mean not hunting and that's problematic. Of course, in, you know, in the short term, we can use contraception in many areas to alleviate the problem as well. And the thing about Joe Rogan, when he made the appeal to the ethical idea, that it wound me up because there's a, a picture of him after he'd hunted a bear. I think it was a black bear or, or a grizzly bear they were up in, uh, in Canada. And I thought, well, who, who are you protecting that bear from when you killed them, when you mercilessly shot them with a crossbow? And this is another thing. I think hunters like to make an appeal to something, but fundamentally they enjoy it. It's like what we were saying before with the taste argument. People use all sorts of different excuses to skirt around the actual fact that they enjoy doing what they do. A hunter doesn't go out and begrudgingly pull the trigger on the rifle. I mean, that's the idea. If you said that you were hunting for ethical reasons, you would be remorseful, surely. You know, you'd be like, oh, I have to do this, but it's terrible, but I understand it's for the greater good. But that's not the situation. Hunters go out with glee at the prospect of killing animals. And so to try and disguise that as being beneficial for these animals who potentially have children they were looking after, have friends who were, up until that point, probably having a, a fairly decent life, to then pull the trigger and kill them prematurely and say that you're doing it for their own good is ridiculous because, of course, you know, we, could, we could use that argument to justify killing anyone. We could say, well, a human might suffer when they're older, let's kill them now, or a dog might suffer when they're older, let's kill them now. But we'd never say that was ethically justified because, of course, to take life when it's not necessary in that moment is not justifiable. Yeah, the hunting thing. Boy, it's, uh, <laughs> it's a minefield, isn't it? But uh, there's a lot going on there for sure. I am from uh, <clears throat> Kentucky and I go back to visit quite a bit because my whole family still lives there. And um, it, it, you have a family member that's, that, that's a hunter that just really loves it mostly, he says, because he just loves to be out in uh, nature and have uh, be surrounded by wild life and uh you know wild trees and wild everything and i'm always saying maybe you could just go for a hike or you know experience it that way <laughs> um but I, I my my question with hunting that it doesn't seem to ever come up it, you know is all the you know all of the reasons that you just gave overpopulations different scenarios um but no one ever talks about blowing up families so when you kill the buck, right, you, you've killed the, the does 
and and where are their children and are they safe and cared for and I, I, that that to me is it, I don't know why it just comes up for me as as the roughest part of any hunting because you you don't know what family you're blowing up uh, th- that all of a sudden they didn't come come back to their area because uh, you've blown their head off and I I, I, I in Kentucky I see dead deer on the side of the highway as often as you see like a plastic cup. It is literally, and I'm not even exaggerating, every couple miles, especially during the season, whatever the hell that means. I, I really don't know. But You mean it's because they, um, they run across? Yeah, oh, they, yeah. They get hit by cars? Absolutely. And trucks. I mean, at, they're yes. running Because running we're from overpopulated, the... which I don't true. need to teach you about. Uh, and so there's a hunting argument there. That they're going to get hit by cars. What what's the worst death? From what I understand, a lot of the time when there's higher rates of deer being killed by cars is also during the hunting season. Part of the reason they think that might be is because deer are running away from the shots. Yeah. Another thing about the deer population thing is um, there there are deer farms in the U.S., which is a confusing thing. I think there's about four thousand deer farms in the U.S. Ohio and Texas. I think are the two states with the most deer farms. And I don't understand the logic of how we can have a situation where there's too many deer, but we're farming tens of thousands of deer every single year. And some of those deer are released to be hunted. So it, it doesn't really add up. And I think, again, even with the car hunt, cars hitting, there, most deer are not going to be hit by cars. And so I guess the point remains that you might be killing a deer who has, has a family, you know, killing a deer who's not going to meet that end. And so, again, we're kind of stabbing in the dark to say well something bad might happen you know hypothetically in the future so we should end their life now it doesn't really doesn't really add up and another thing with hunters is that they're prone to killing the strongest animals that exist and that's a big issue because you know natural selection dictates the strong animals survive and the weak animals were the ones who who died and that would keep this the strong genetic uh, pool passed down generation to generation and so hunters are, are shooting the biggest stags and they're, and they're shooting the strongest looking animals they can find and that actually has a, a direct negative consequence in the evolution of these animals and some animals around the world i think uh, as a ram or um, a similar similar animal who now doesn't grow horns or you know, grows lesser horns because of the fact that from an evolutionary standpoint it's now recognized as a bad attribute even though historically of course having horns would be a st- sign of strength and protection but now it's seen as a bad thing so yeah there are minor things that we have to address i suppose in the cars hitting we should find ways of alleviating that but of course there are many ways that we could probably alleviate that other than uh shooting them i know they've built these right. big bridges in certain places i think they exist in the us these kind of bridges over freeways or highways so that animals can walk over them and not be at risk of being hit and so things like that are the compassionate and humane ways of dealing with the problem but gunning an animal down because hypothetically something bad might happen to them doesn't seem like the most logical argument there i don't think so the deer farms i just didn't know this they i I've mm. thought that they were for food so they went they killed them and oh, packaged yeah. them but they're they're to release for people to hunt sometimes it's kind of like a tag hunting i think where you pay so basically they will breed certain bucks so they again they breed the biggest or the longest horns they'll get released into kind of like a closed off area which will be a big closed off area because they'll get closed off someone pays us lump sum of money shoots them then puts the head on the mantelpiece and brags about how they've killed this massive stag but the stag was bred in an agricultural condition with those traits released into an area that they had no chance of escaping from for someone to drive around in a jeep and, and shoot them it's it's yeah. pathetic and also, of course, incredibly, you know, immoral as well. Super, just yeah. like the the lions and tigers yeah. in right. Africa, it, right? Canned, it's, canned it's, hunting, it's yeah. Surprise, yeah. Canned uh, hunting, We, we yeah. also call it. Um, you know, Dotsie, your argument about breaking up deer families mm-hmm. is not going to wash with a carnivore. That's not kind of not the way they look at the world. Mm-hmm. That's mm-hmm. that's our number one argument, maybe, but not it's it's way down on their list, right, Ed? And so I'm wondering, how do you? So there's some arguments that that vegans, even though we think it's really important, just aren't as effective. Do you have thoughts on that? Just because the, they they really appeal to us doesn't mean they appeal to someone who doesn't have the perspective of a vegan, mm-hmm. of an ethical vegan. Yeah. It's absolutely spot on. I think it's important we advocate. We don't advocate from the position we're at. We advocate from the position that the person we're talking to is at. So we try and meet them on their level. And so I think really what we should aim to do is just turn their arguments against them. We're not necessarily putting forth, you know, 
our emotional or our you know, logical arguments in that sense. We're putting, we're really just trying to turn their arguments against them because we want to disprove how they believe. Um, I think, you know, we run the risk, I suppose it's what you were just saying then, of kind of straw manning someone or straw womaning someone in the sense of we create a depiction of what we think they stand for as a meat eater, when actually we should just be arguing against their points and positions. So I think always try and come from where they're at. And I think that's why, you know, using certain language is also very important, making sure that we're very cautious of uh, not overstepping what the person we're talking to might might uh, you know feel comfortable with or what level they might be at and so i think just meeting someone where they're at is um what i would say to that but it's a very very good point because we do presume that people are going to click in the same way that we do when i first went vegan i thought all i'd have to tell someone is that animals are you know dying violently and all this suffering exists and people will be like oh my goodness ed you're so right let's let's all go vegans together and that just did not happen and so i quickly realized that people don't resonate necessarily with how you you know what makes you resonate um, and don't always understand your position because when you're not vegan, the position of a vegan is, you know, extreme, weird, you know, militant. And so trying to remember that when we advocate is important. These people are us 10, five, however many years ago with the same thoughts and feelings about veganism that we used to have. And I remember there were many, many times before I was vegan that I said that vegans were, you know, this weird sense of, you know, had no sense of humor, were just really, you know, militant and extreme. And um, I think of myself then, what would have resonated with me? And I think an appeal to, oh, it's sad what's happening to animals wouldn't have worked in the same way as, you know, kind of meeting me at the level and using my arguments against me probably would have done. Yeah. Although you say, you know, it, it, it doesn't happen very often. It hasn't happened very often. I know you've got to have one story of someone that you flipped on the spot because they were maybe kind of built like us. They were, they were ready for it and they were just like, oh my God. The, what? Okay, I'm changing. Do you will you share a story with us that was must have felt so rewarding after all the fighting yeah, all the time? Yeah, and actually I think you raised another good point, which is you know, people are at different, you know, stages and before going vegan, you have all these different moments that lead up to that. You know, there's all these different I think of when I was a child, I think of when I was a teenager and all these little moments that I think of about, you know, seeing an animal in a certain way and feeling bad and kind of resonating, you know, with blackfish and all these different things and how it led me to veganism. Um, but anyway, yeah, I remember I was doing a university tour back in late 2017 or early 2018. And at a time we were taking VR headsets around with us. So um, the animal equality ones that we're using. So you put the headset on and you're basically, you know, in the position of an animal. And the one that we were shown was a pig one. So you're literally a pig in a farm. You go all the way through to the process of being slaughtered. And it's as, you know, as you are the pig or you are the pig. And I remember this girl, I think she was writing a university paper, actually. She was just doing a little bit of reporting about the event for their local or like a, in, a, in a university newspaper. And she asked if she could try it so she could write about it. And I was like, absolutely, of course, please do. And afterwards, or about halfway through, she took the VR goggles off and was just crying. Um, and it was very emotional. You know, I don't, I don't normally feel that emotional, but when I see other people crying, I think that's when I normally start to get a little bit choked up and seeing her crying and having such a reaction to it was, you know, a very surreal experience to see someone and think, oh my goodness, you know, that's working with them so well. And she actually put the glasses back on because she felt she had to finish the video, which I thought was, you know, very brave and noble of her. Yeah, and afterwards she was like, yeah, that's it, you know, that's that. How can I see that? How can I have this reaction and not change? Um, so that was a really rewarding experience. And yeah, I've had a lot like that where, you know, these VR headsets or when you're having a conversation with people and they just have that aha moment. And I think, you know, for most of those people, it's been building up to that for a little while. And you're probably the, you know, the final, um, right. the final piece of that puzzle for them. And for her, that VR video definitely was. And I had a little conversation around it with her. And yeah, it's, it's a lovely feeling. And it's rewarding because... I, before I was vegan, I wished someone had told me about veganism. You know, now I, I wish before I was that someone just stopped me and show me this video, had a conversation with me. And so, in a way, I think that we have an obligation to put ourselves in these debates or in these conversations or in these scenarios because if these, if these people go vegan, and most people are going to go vegan at some point, we hope, right? Then they'll think back and be grateful that you did that for them, you know, that you showed them that video, that you had that conversation. So I think we owe it to people who are not yet vegan to go out there and and do these things. And she reminded me of that in a big way as well. I think. Mm. I Tell that. us about you mentioned before you were vegan. Who was mm -hmm. Ed Winters before he became Earthling Ed, and what did change you over to veganism? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. Um, I mean. 
before, I guess I was just a regular person in the sense of I grew up in a family where, you know, eating meat, dairy, and eggs was a standard thing. In fact, we used to laugh about it. I, I think in a way, my family is a little bit more than just your average meat eating family. We, you know, seemed growing up, I remember we seemed quite offended by the concept of being a vegetarian. We didn't know what a vegan was. So we used to make jokes about it around the dinner table, even though it's just us, you know, there was no vegetarian even there to laugh at the expense of. We'd just make these jokes. And I don't know, it was, it was a slightly strange environment at times, I think. Um, and I, I still get that from my family now um, in the odd times where, where they're allowed to speak to me in that way, I suppose. And I guess, you know, yeah. But growing up, yeah, it, it was kind of a standard situation. I remember being, I think, 11 or 12 years old and being in, in an English literature class and we were studying a book and the character in the book was vegetarian. And for some reason, my teacher, you know, asked about vegetarianism to the class. And so I put my hand up and said that all vegetarians were pale, weak and skinny. And I remember like my teacher looked at me like, what are you saying that for? And I realized now looking back and I was just saying that because that's what I've been raised to believe. So yeah, for me, it was quite an abstract concept, the notion of not doing these things. Even when I was at uni, I was around vegetarians, but I didn't really get it. I actually, I, I must have had a, must have been there in some capacity because I actually had a, a pet hamster called Rupert. Um, I used to, you know, Rupert was the best hamster. He was amazing. And, and I, I loved him to pieces even when I used to eat animals. And I remember that he kind of caused me to think a little bit differently. You know, it's, it's such a classic story. It's almost a cliche, isn't it, that a pet causes us to think about other animals. But he definitely did that. And I remember one day I was reading the BBC online and I came across this story about a truck carrying, I think, about six and a half thousand chickens that crashed on the way to a slaughterhouse near the city of Manchester in England. And I remember reading this story and being really horrified because I'd never recognized that the animals I consumed could suffer. And KFC was my favorite food before I stopped eating animals. And in my fridge <laughs> You're was <welcome>. a KFC. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And in my, so in my fridge was, it was a KFC from the night before. And I was reading this story and just being horrified that hundreds of the birds had died. There were hundreds more that were suffering and they were all gonna go to a slaughterhouse. And I realized that I thought about all the thousands of birds that were gonna be killed in the slaughterhouses on that day, but I would never hear about because the truck didn't crash. Um, and that was shocking to me. So I went vegetarian, this was 2014. And then I went vegan early 2015 because I saw the documentary Earthlings. And uh, afterwards, after I watched the film, I went and sat with Rupert. And I went and sat with Rupert because I wanted to smile again. You know, I was crying and I didn't want to cry. I wanted to feel happy. So I thought Rupert would make me happy. But Rupert put me in all sorts of a, a crisis because I looked at him and I recognized that he could feel and suffer. And I thought, if I wouldn't want anyone to hurt Rupert, then how can I justify any of the things I've just seen in the film or anything else that happens to animals because I pay for it? And that was that moment where I thought this is, you know, not good enough. And I went vegan 2015, yeah, January 20, 2015, six years ago nearly. So uh, seven. Your family is six years ago. Six years ago. Okay. Six years. I'm at time. Yeah. I know it. It, it adds up fast. Uh, your family is not vegan then. Now, is that what you just said earlier? No. Wow. Yeah. No. How are they? Are any of them on the journey? Last time I spoke to my dad, he said said something that oh, I think this veganism is making more and more sense, which is oh. good. Um, but and my parents are, are both divorced and remarried. So I've got, you know, double the double the parents to deal with in that sense. And I guess it's harder to get through to all of them. But I think slowly but surely. I mean, I know they watch my content, um, but, you know, it's, it's really hard to say. I remember this was a couple of years ago. My mom came to visit me in London because she lives uh, further north. And she brought a ham sandwich because my stepdad had made her a ham sandwich. And she told me that he told her to eat it in front of me. And I thought, you know, that's... Well, you know, that's a strange one, isn't it? I thought, well, that's pretty, pretty spiteful. So I've definitely got progress that needs to be made. But I think overall, yeah, they're, they're pretty accepting the sense of they've never had a problem with what I do. Although I remember I say that I remember when I first went vegan, I sent my mum an email basically outlining all the reasons I'd gone vegan, you know, all the health, the environment, the ethics. And my mum had replied saying that she was worried that I was going to die from not eating correctly and these synthetic proteins I was going to be consuming weren't healthy. And, you know, I don't know what synthetic proteins are necessarily, but she was obviously very worried about them. So I think, you know, deep down, maybe there's some concern there, but overall they're okay with it. They're just not vegan yet. People do use the fact that the alternative meats are quote unquote processed that as a, as a way that veganism right. must be bad, even though you and as I, if animal all three processed. of us know that animal meat is <laughs> very processed, processed. <laughs> but it also, um, but, but to be fair, the alternative meats are far more processed. They do have, we have to, we have to give it to them. Yeah, it's true. They do have 
a lot of the uh, they're not um, whole foods. And well, I think um, it depends on how you uh, define processed. Because I think if you really mm-hmm. looked, if if you put them next to each other and you watch the process of what an animal goes through to get there, <laughs> and and what like a Beyond Burger goes with some beets and well, some pea protein, less cruelty. Yeah, yeah, but they but they do. I mean, they're not the the healthiest thing, but are, are being but they are the least cruel, and we can definitely go for that and the best for the environment. And better for your health, um, probably because there's fewer saturated fats. But anyway, so th- they folks love to just jump on the uh, attacking the alternative meat. What do you have to say to that, Ed, when folks do that? Yeah, I mean, I don't think we should be under any um, assumption that they're automatically healthy just because they are plant-based. I think it's okay to say that, sure, they're not the healthiest thing you can eat. Mm-hmm. But as you say, comparatively, um, of course, environmentally, you know, 90 percent better in most in most ways ethically of course there's no competition and from a health perspective yeah again we might not say that these products are necessarily you know quote unquote objectively healthy but in comparison you know we don't have the cholesterol we're reducing the saturated fat the trans fats um the igf1 promoting hormones the antibiotics all these different components that are, are used in in you know or found in um animal products and again the processing thing is so silly as, as you correctly say dotsy these, these products are processed. Like the idea that, of course, we get a piece of bacon or any animal products on our plate and it's not gone through any sort of processing is obviously ridiculous because for a sentient being to be born, raised, killed, and then up, end up on our plate has to go through some element of, uh, of processing. So it depends what you classify as a good or bad processing, I suppose. But yeah, I mean, comparatively, even from a health perspective, it's, it's still better. It's just, of course, you know, lentils and legumes and grains and such would be ideal in that category. Yeah, they've forgotten about pink slime and inject it, how they inject the, the chickens with salt yeah. water. And you're right, all the antibiotics yeah. and the the issues with um, E. coli hormones. and, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, um, so uh, I want to turn to uh, dairy for a, a, a little moment. Um, tell us about uh, Surge's Milk, and this is your moment campaign um, that you started and what that was in opposition of and, and why. Yeah, I mean, the search we've done a lot of work on on dairy, um, whether that's um, putting cameras up in in farms and and you know releasing that footage to the press. And we did a big campaign uh, called Dismantle Dairy, where um, we had footage that was from uh, the second, basically the second biggest agricultural person in the UK. There's an organisation called the National Farmers Union here, which are our big union representing farmers. Mm-hmm. And there was a guy called Guy Smith who was the deputy president, um, and we basically revealed on his farm um, there was tons of abuse, tons of terrible things, which eventually he lost his job over it, which was, you know, obviously a good thing. Um, but on top of that, we also, we, you know, we also are aware that, you know, many farmers aren't dairy farming or farm animal farming in general, because they're inherently bad people. A lot of the people are stuck in this industry. They don't know anything different. They've never been given a chance to diversify. Their families did it before them. They feel they have an obligation to keep on the family heirloom. It's, it's a toxic environment for many farmers. It's not one they necessarily take pleasure in. Um, and so back in early June, I think it was, there was a campaign that was created in the UK called um, Milk Your Moments, which was basically the dairy industry trying to get people to consume more dairy. Obviously, the coronavirus pandemic hit the dairy industry hard, like it did for most industries, um, and dairy sales are falling anyway. So they're in a bit of a, a tricky situation. What was really scandalous and what I think we at Surgeon and a lot of vegans got upset about was that the majority of the funding for their advertising campaign came from the government, from the UK, the UK taxpayer. And I couldn't believe that there was a TV advert and adverts around London and, and the UK that I'd inherently paid for and everyone who pays their taxes had paid for. I thought that was, I thought that was absolutely scandalous that they were allowed to do that. Um, so we weren't very happy. So we decided to set up a kind of a counter comp- campaign called Milk, This Is Your Moment. Um, and what we did is we put together a handbook and a document that outlined uh, basically how animal farmers and dairy farmers in particular could change to plant-based production. And there's an organization called ReFarmed that works here um, that works with making dairy farmers turn into oat farmers. And they've had some success with, with doing that. And so we basically wanted to make an appeal to farmers saying there's another way, you know, you can still claim subsidies, you can still make money from it. And in fact, looking forward, it'll be even more of a, a, a bountiful financial venture than the one you're currently in. Um, and, you know, it's just about switching and, and asking for help. And so that's what we wanted to do with that campaign is to say, you know, look, we, we, we're not particularly favorable of what you do, but we also understand that to, if we want to get to where we want to be, it requires a bit of cooperation and cooperation can go a long way in, in making the world a better place. And that's kind of what we wanted to achieve with that 
and uh, to really highlight to the consumer how their tax money has been spent. You know, it's, it's, we're in the middle of a pandemic. The NHS here has been struggling. People can't afford to buy food, and yet the government has got what best part of a million pounds to give to the dairy industry so they can put a TV advert out there to buy more dairy. That just doesn't that just doesn't make sense. And I think people need to be aware of how their money has been spent. I mean the USDA and the US government is just as bad with the bailouts that they give to animal farmers year in, year out. It's it's a terrible thing. And if we were to use that money more effectively, we could easily create environmental and ethical incentives to help farmers transition and, and create a better world. And I think that's something that needs to happen looking forward. Definitely. Yeah, I mean, over here, it's a, a systematic prop up of the dairy industry since World War II. So this is, that yeah. sounds to me so like in the UK, this was just a um, a singular campaign. It's not ge- a generalized system that props up the dairy industry in the UK, or is it? Well, we do have subsidies, yeah. So unfortunately, okay. the dairy industry is subsidized. So this is like an, an extra on top just for them to have a, an advertising campaign, which uh, is just something similar to what the dairy checkoff does as well in the US. Um, yeah, with the got milk stuff. And yeah. it's just crazy. I, I, in fact, I... We Serge released a video recently looking at the milk lie, you know, what happened, you know, why Americans consume milk, how the USDA has colluded with the dairy industry, mm-hmm. um, and how the checkoff program incentivizes fast food chains to put more yep. cheese and, and dairy mm-hmm. products on the menu. It's it's shocking because the USDA sets the nutritional guidelines and yet they're lobbied to and work with the animal farming industries. And lo and behold, the you know, rates of recommended dairy consumption are enough to increase cancers and heart disease, you know, two, three times, aren't they? It's just Mm-hmm. It's great. People are dying because of this, you know, yeah. animals and people and the, and the planet. And especially BIPOC people. I mean, they spend $92 million a year in the marketing for Milk Pep, and it makes about 70% of the people sick. And it is uh, much higher rates just in relation to lactose intolerant, not even talking about hormonal-based cancers, uh, saturated fat, trans fats, just talking about lactose intolerant, right? Uh, 85, 90, 98% um, completely intolerant to digesting dairy. So it is, dairy is a racist act. And yeah. that, that, that has to come forward. Uh, we, we work on that all the time here in, in the U.S. I mean, we, we really just really just started about a year ago as we were fighting the dietary guidelines. And I went to speak in Washington and realizing that this really hadn't been brought up. You know, all of the, the the research on our side, let's say, had been brought forward to the dietary guidelines as it relates to, again, hormonal-based cancers and type 2 diabetes and such. But they really hadn't, it hadn't been brought up that this is, a, this is dietary racism right at its best, uh, formed by uh, white supremacy. And they didn't like that when I talked about that. No. And so we, we, we've, we've made some some steps forward in that way, but I don't have any delusions uh, that it's going to happen fast, the, the, the changes to the dietary guidelines, but they are listening. They gave a nod to dietary racism in their uh, report that the committee turned over to the USDA to make the decision uh, just this past June. So we'll see how they come out, but yeah. Do you think it was more effective, Dotsy, that <clears throat> a blonde Southern white woman brought forth that argument? Do you think that hit the... Because the... Um, Ed, the the whole dietary commission, they were all white, right? Except for one. The committee. Oh, yeah. No, not one. All. Oh, yeah. All, yeah. 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 I, I, I don't know. I think it was more like I just, there's something, you know how we are over here. There's something very American about, uh, you know, politicians, uh, military, and Olympian athletes. Like they, the, just the USA has some sort of obsession with those three categories. Mm-hmm. And so I just played it up and I wore my big old Team USA jacket, which was facing the entire audience as I went for it. So I think it was more that, like, what is this chick? You know, and I had been inside a system for so long in, inside the US Olympic Committee and at the training centers where dairy is posed as the perfect food and almost really the only food that you're going to really be able to recover well from because it is the title sponsor of the U.S. Olympic Committee. So, you know, I think I had a perspective there that's like, you know, I've I've kind of been under that roof and dealt with those confines for a long time. So uh, I think it was probably more that. But yeah. You're my hero. Yeah, just you <laughs> it's know, true. We all fight, right? <laughs> Every day. Um, Ed, tell us about Surge. This is an, a nonprofit that you started. The Dotsy started Switch for Good, which is to com- specifically to combat the dairy industry. Um, tell us about why you started Surge. 
Yeah, I think it was back in 2016 um, and myself, my partner and a few other people at the time just decided that we wanted to host our own events. We wanted to have a, an animal rights group of our own where we could um, produce online content um, and host a, an animal rights march. And so we, apart from this year, of course, because of COVID, hosted a, a march in London and that's taken place in uh, dozens of cities around the world, um, marching for animal rights. And so we just felt that we wanted to do something I love my YouTube and I love doing social media stuff. But I wanted to have something else as well, like on the street campaigning um, and also media production in a different way. Um, and so really it's just about trying to campaign on behalf of animals as much as we could. We did a, a big protest a campaign against London Fashion Week for using fur, which in the end got them to drop fur. Um, and so different things like that have just been our focus. Um, but this year, because of the pandemic, We've really decided, of course, to take take it online because, of course, you know the um, outside world hasn't necessarily been too favourable. So we've been doing a lot of online content, producing weekly videos where we try and produce content that, that's professional and shareable and accessible about different concepts related to veganism. So we've done uh, ones on honey, um, ones on the environment in terms of what we do in the oceans. We've got a video going up tonight that's about meat and masculinity. So different topics that we hope are, are useful. And so we just try and... Um, I suppose cover as much as we possibly can in that way um, and give people resources because myself personally, I think the search team as well, what we kind of want to make sure that we do isn't just create content that hopefully turns non-vegans vegan, but also gives vegans arguments and gives vegans confidence. And they know that, oh, I can share this video. This will go down well. You know, this has the information. I trust this information. So trying to build up something that has a bit of credibility um, and integrity that people, vegans know will be a good resource to share around is um, something else that we we try and make sure that we do as well. But yeah, we, we try and do lots of different things and uh, moving forward, we've got some other plans for things to do as well. And we'll just see see how it, how, see how it goes. Well, It'll your happen. website is full of terrific content. And you've also been doing, congratulations on uh, the, the fur being dropped from London Fashion Week. You also had a very successful campaign against St. Helen's goat milk farm. And it, 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 it uh, ended up a lot of supermarkets dropped their product. Tell us about that. What made it so successful? I mean, I think, part, I mean, I don't know if it's the same in the US. I was in a supermarket a few days ago um, and it was infuriating to see that in the plant-based section, there's goat's milk. So you have all the plant milks and then there's goat milk as if that's part of the alternative. And I think we have this idea here that goat milk is this uh, very wholesome farming. And actually what's alarming is that dairy consumption is dropping but goat milk isn't and it's predicted that goat milk consumption will increase i've done outreach events where people will say oh but goat milk's fine oh like, so everything many people I've just told you about cow's milk yeah is, is the exact same for goats and it's it's heartbreaking because of course goats are just such gentle and lovely animals by nature and so we the biggest company goat milk company in the uk is st helens and they have this reputation of being this really wholesome company it's a healthy product it's good for you know it's good for people with lactose intolerance and it's great for the animals um and so we decided that we wanted to, to kind of expose that that's not true and not just focus on the cows but focus on the other the, the other side of dairy that often gets ignored um so yeah we we had footage from one of the farms the supply st helens um, I mean, I, I know that you've seen it, of course, and it's, it's horrible. Um, and thank you for signing the open letter that we did as well. Um, but it's really horrible because you see the fact that this is a facade. We all know as vegans it's a facade, but it was the first time that many non-vegans had seen that. And I don't think many non-vegans had realized that. And it literally says gentle on the packaging for St. Helens. They use that word. So when you see that these animals have been punched and dragged and is screaming and uh, are being just euthanized on the farms. It's it's a harrowing watch for anyone, and it really caught the the, the nation and, and made the news and, and was you know broadcast for, for for many days. And we made regional news a few times on television and such. And um, it led to supermarkets dropping them. Um, and unfortunately, the supermarkets have St Helens back, but they've cut off that one farm. Which you know for us as vegans, we know it's a systemic and systematic problem, and we know that what we saw on that farm will be the same on all the farms. And even if it's not the illegal abuses, there's the legal abuses that are going on. We know that it's the same. Um, but they did cut off that one farm, which I guess is you know positive in that sense. Um, and people do know a little bit more about it, and hopefully we can keep pushing that um, goat message, you know, the reality of what's happening in goat farming. Um, and yeah, there was a point where um, the farmer, the, the owner of the farm had said that they might have to close because they're not getting any revenue. And so we were like, this is an opportunity for us to give them the handbook that we made about how in, having to change and put some pressure on them to, to help us rescue goats. And so we set this open letter and asked, you know, people, influential people in the vegan 
community to sign it um, in the hope that that'll put pressure on them to to release the goats. But unfortunately, they didn't they didn't let us save any of the goats, um, which is mm. sad, but potentially not surprising, I suppose. So, what happened to those goats when? Well, I mean, presumably um, the farm still operates. It'll probably sell to a different seller. And so we, the, a group of activists from nearby did a protest on the farm and it seemed like a European company came and picked up the milk. And they had, I think, Belgium license plates. So um, it's a very good, very realistic chance that it's now been taken abroad. So unfortunately for the goats, nothing changed on their part. Um, but hopefully a bit of awareness was raised. And, you know, I, I think what's really good to know is that people do care about this. Um, and people were outraged and were sickened and even comments from people you know saying that we're going to go vegan on the back of it is really really good but what we have to keep doing is chipping away at the you know the illusion of animal farming and for every investigation that's released for every you know piece of information that comes out we, we chip away at their armor just a little bit more and of course you know for decades the armor has been very thick but when we're getting through it now and i think every time an investigation comes out every time a farm's exposed that argument of oh it's just one bad farm or one bad farmer gets eroded little by little. And I think we were breaking down that trust, you know, very, very quickly now. And people are really starting to understand that actually this isn't related to just one issue here and there. This is a you know, systemic problem. And if we can bring the GOAT conversation into that, and, you know, we, we are, you know, fully bringing all of the system into the, into play. And I think that's what we hope to do moving forward. But unfortunately for those GOATs, it's, um, yeah, nothing changed for them. Not yet anyway. You have uh, spoken very openly and often about that it's not if, right, but when the next pandemic happens, and it'll probably come from a, a chicken or a pig farm, potentially. Uh, and, and the UK uh, had mad cow disease. So uh, we're wondering if they are taking this as uh, seriously at all, because I got to tell you, it, they're not in the United States. It's just you know, purposefully, I, I'm assuming. Um, but what it, what is the energy over there and, and what are the discussions about a potential next pandemic and do people believe it's going to come from animal agriculture? Well, I think currently we're culling tens of thousands of turkeys because bird flu, we're having a bird flu outbreak. And I think there's two, maybe even three strains of bird flu currently circulating around poultry farms here. Um, thankfully, for us humans, they're not um, contagious or they're not, they're not life running or, or problematic for us, which yeah. is good. But of course that can change at any point. Yeah. I think on like a political side of it, I, I don't see much conversation really. It's very demoralizing. I think, I think politically we've got a long way to go. I mean, for, for example, we know concrete, the antibiotic resistance is a thing that's happening. You know, we had a, one of our leading politicians give a, a big talk about how in, by 2050, more people will be dying of antibiotic resistance than they will cancers at, currently, right? And this person was, was Chancellor of the Exchequer, you know, person in, in charge of how the money is used, but that didn't change how subsidies were distributed. He didn't stop subsidizing the pig industry or the poultry industry. And so even with something that we know concretely is a problem, that we know animal farming is the leading driver of causing even that's not creating any 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 significant change, not not real tangible change that's going to alleviate the problem. And so, with something that is still concrete, but but you know a little bit more abstract when it comes to to viruses, I, I don't think that we're getting far politically. I think from a personal perspective or from like a societal perspective, I think that that conversation is working. I remember at the beginning of the pandemic, I put up a post basically saying that COVID-19 started because we exploit animals. MERS, SARS, BSE, Ebola started because we exploit animals. And that post got censored. And I, the USA Today did like a write-up on it, actually. And so I was in conversation with the USA Today, and they basically said that it wasn't false, but they couldn't confirm that it was wholly true. Anyway, a few weeks after that, The Guardian published an article which basically agreed with what I was saying. They, they weren't referencing me, but they basically outlined the similar points that I'd made. Um, and then Vox did something similar. The New York Times did something similar. The Washington Post did something similar. So I think at the beginning of 2020, no one really was talking about animal farming and, and disease, not infectious zoonotic disease at least maybe just chronic disease but now that conversation is part of the dialogue and even though politically i think it's probably not going to change anything drastically i think people are more aware of that link now and that's definitely a good thing and it really is just a, a not if but when scenario it, it if we keep playing with fire we're going to get burnt again and i think mm -hmm. we might hopefully we won't have this situation but we might live to look back on COVID 19 and be like wow that was nothing compared to what this is. And of course, realistically, we know that there's something far worse out there, things that have not even been created yet, but will 
probably be created in these uh, hotbeds for, for virus creation, which are, of course, animal farms. It's a scary predicament, and we're playing with our own lives. We're playing with the lives of the world. We're playing with, you know, our civilization as we know it. I mean, COVID-19 brought everything to a halt. The economy's collapsed, unemployment's through the roof over something that realistically is nowhere near as worse, as bad as it could have been. So imagine if we have a virus that's even just four times as bad as COVID-19. What does the world look like then? Imagine if we have a virus that lives up to something like the worst bird flus that exist that are killing, you know, it could kill 50% of people. Imagine how the world would be if COVID-19 was killing 50% of people. It didn't matter if you were young or old, had underlying health conditions or not. That's the end of the world as we know it. And to think that could come because we enjoy KFC or you know, any type of chicken products is absolutely outrageous. And I just think if we were to look at our world objectively and look down on what we do, we just think that we were crazy people, you know? But instead, from where we are, we call ourselves intelligent and mature and emotionally complex. But realistically, these are just these words that we don't necessarily even live by, not properly, because if we realized what we were doing, which we which we can realize because it's there in front of us, mm -hmm. the only sane and rational thing to do would just be to stop it immediately. But we don't seem to do that, which is concerning, I think. The very concerning. We had Le Leah Garces on and she said uh, from all that she knows about uh, bird flu that we're really just about one strain away from it affecting humans. And when we have all of these alternatives, if there's one category that I think they've nailed, it's chicken nuggets. I had them last night. It's, I'm sorry. It's, it's, it's really they're the same. It, it, Ten years ago, a, they had it because um, it, Ian's my husband's nephew comes from the Midwest only will eat. He was, you know, 10 at the time. He'd only eat chicken nuggets. And one other thing, my nephew, we fed him he, vegan chicken nuggets and he did not no know the difference. My, did kid, not know no. the difference. <laughs> and kids will tell yeah. you. <laughs> so it's true. They'll be honest. <laughs> <on> the, <laughs> yeah. And uh, speaking of food, you you have your own uh, restaurant and bar that uh, is all vegan, obviously, in London. So tell us how your chicken nuggets are over there. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we're, we're good for chicken nuggets here as well. Um, yeah, so we've got, yeah, Unity Diner, um, which is, yeah, a non-profit vegan restaurant. We started it just over two years ago, so I think about 27 months ago or so now. Um, and so, yeah, we, we set up as a non-profit because what we wanted to do was raise money to um, basically fund different animal rights work and ultimately to to get a sanctuary as well, to to buy a piece of land so that we could rehome animals on that land as well. So we've been working on doing these things, but we've used the money to do um, you put money towards uh, advertising campaigns on the London Underground and um, in different areas around London. And yeah, we just really want to give back to the community, have a space where people can eat. And then hopefully, you know, in the long run, through people eating there, they can contribute to something that, that helps animals as well and create like a nice cycle of um, veganism, if you like, you know, nice vegan food and hopefully a bit of vegan advocacy on the side as well. Um, and it's been great. Yeah, we actually had to move just over a year ago because we'd outgrown the first location. So we've moved into a bigger location. Um, and of course, nice. COVID-19 has not been particularly helpful for us. But yeah, we're very fortunate. And London's got a great vegan scene. And they seem to like the food a lot, which is nice as well. You know, it's, it's a fun thing to do. Yeah, I looked at the menu and I was salivating <laughs> just looking at, the, watch, looking at the pictures and everything. Oh, so it sounds great. Unity, is that what it's called? Yeah, Unity. Yeah. Great. Well, and what's going on over there? Can you guys eat outside? Did you have to do tents outside? Can, are you guys? Can you guys eat back inside now? Or, well, we're technically in full lockdown, so everything's closed until oh. tomorrow. I think everything reopens again. Um, so yeah, we've been in full lockdown for like a month again. Second, second lockdown. Second. Um, but yeah, we can reopen again tomorrow. Um, and it's just like we have to have special precautions inside, but we can have people sitting inside, which is. Okay. Which is good because it's awfully cold here. It's awfully, I was going to say. Yeah. The whole tent thing probably doesn't work as well in the UK. <laughs> it does in Southern Cal. Like in Europe, no. <laughs> no. Oh, no. my gosh. Oh. Thank you so much for coming on our show. We're so honored to have you. And uh, all your amazing work, listeners, watchers of this, of Switch for Good, who are listening and watching right now, please go and Google Earthling Ed and, and look at some of his amazing videos of him and himself. And share them. Yeah, yeah. and share them mm -hmm. uh, and everything that Surge does too. So thank you very much for being such a light in the world. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you right back at you. And thank you for, for having me on the podcast. I do really appreciate it. And it's been fun. It's some really good questions. Like really, really great. So I appreciate you asking me lots of varied things. It's been, it's been great. I think we uh, traversed a lot of different topics. The listeners are going to love you. <laughs>
So thank you so much for tuning in today. If we helped you in any way, then click the subscribe button and let's keep hanging out together. We have so much more to share with you. And if you need more information on actually making the switch for good, please visit us at switchforgood.org for loads of info. And you can subscribe to our mailing list where you will receive all sorts of super cool gifts, discount codes to our very fave dairy-free products, and a lifetime of powerful health tips. So join us on the journey to switch for good. This is the future.